Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Uh, there is no cooking today. I'm going to do uh, an FAQ. I get tons of questions uh, in the comment sections over and over and over and over again, and I thought I'd do a video where I try to answer most of them. So the first question is, is that your home kitchen? No, it's a studio. Uh, this is a studio in a building in our backyard. And then the second question that I get most often is, since it's a studio in your backyard, people assume that the oven doesn't work and the sink doesn't work. The sink works. The oven works too. Um, and I don't know how to prove that to you really, so I've got it on broil. And so yes, you can see the elements are red. It's hot in there. So when I put something in the oven to cook it, to bake it, to roast it, whatever, it actually does cook in this oven. Everything in here works. And so, even up here in the cupboards, um, I store all of the stuff that I need to cook. Uh, not everything. There's a giant storage room in the basement with a lot of, uh, of dishes and pots and pans. And you can see that in a previous video that we did a couple of years ago for the studio tour. Next question I get most often is about this cooktop. This is an induction cooktop. Induction works with uh, magnetic fields and it heats the pot. Not my first choice. My first choice would be gas. In our house, we have a gas stove, gas oven. I much prefer cooking with gas, but if I have to cook electric, and because I couldn't get gas out here in the studio, I have to cook electric. Induction is the next best thing to gas. And there are a lot of people that prefer, prefer induction to gas. Um, they like how quickly it heats up and how even the heating is because you get, a, you get even heating across the ring rather than with a gas stove where you just get heating where the flame is. So a lot of people do prefer this. I still prefer gas. And then a lot of people ask me about, um, about cooking on the cooktop with cast iron. They're afraid that cast iron is too heavy and will break the glass. It won't break the glass. Um, I suppose if you took the pan and smashed it, you would break the glass. But under normal wear and tear, it won't break the glass and the glass won't scratch. I've been using this particular cooktop now for probably six years and it's fine, absolutely fine. So this is enameled cast iron. So it is fairly smooth on the bottom. Um, even with bare cast iron, I have absolutely no worries about putting it on there and moving it around. Which brings us to the next question that I get a lot um, is about this pan. This is a Le Creuset brazier. Um, had this probably 15 years now. It is the 4.7 liter version. Um, there are a couple of different sizes that you can get. It is enameled cast iron uh, and incredibly durable. A great pan to cook in. Um, both for frying on the cooktop and for putting in the oven to do long braises. It's a brazier, so you do braising in it. I get asked a lot about this Dutch oven. Um, this is a Frontenac Dutch oven. It is the five quart version. Um, both of these pans were made in France. Now, Frontenac, I've also had this one for about 15 years. Frontenac is a company that has been sold since I bought this and a lot of their pots and pans are now made in China. So bear that in mind if that's something that, uh, that you're worried about. But incredible quality, incredible value because this is something that I would buy once. I mean, yes, it was a very expensive pot. Both of these were very expensive pots, but I use them both a couple of times a week. Uh, they will last my entire lifetime and someone else will get them when I'm done with them and they'll probably last their lifetime and beyond as well. I've not had any trouble with them cracking or getting, uh, getting marked or chipping. And as some people point out all the time, I do use metal utensils in them. Doesn't harm them, doesn't harm them at all doesn't harm them at all. I'm, I suppose if you, again, like the cooktop, whacked it, it would harm it. But um, stirring and doing stuff in it with a metal utensil, no problem, no problem at all. So we'll move on from there. Uh, next, 
most often question I get is about the spoon rest. Let's see, where is the spoon rest? So I've got these silicone spoon rests. Um, they're made by a company called Zeal. I did not buy these. Um, I rented out the studio at one point to a friend of mine um, who did some photography for the company Zeal. And when they left, they left behind a box of product. And I use both of these products over and over and over again. Now, I don't think you can buy them still. That was probably 10 years ago that they left them here in the studio. But this silicone spoon rest is fantastic. And you know, you just chuck it in the dishwasher if you want to chuck it in the dishwasher to clean it up. Um, holds multiple spoons. And these covers, I use them all the time. I don't use plastic wrap or saran wrap in my kitchen. I don't buy it, I don't use it. I have great disdain for that stuff. But I'll use this over top of a bowl um, if I need to cover a bowl and put it in the fridge. Uh, great products. Uh, if you can still find the Zeal product line, I would say they're, they're great products. And if you can't, just look for silicone. Um, be able to find it fairly easily online, I would imagine. Coming back to pots and pans, I get asked all the time about the stainless steel cookware that I use. Uh, these were made by Calphalon. And this is a set of cookware that Calphalon no longer makes. I don't know why. They're absolutely amazing. Um, so these are stainless steel. They are a five ply stainless steel. What that means is that stainless steel on the outside and then sandwiched in between, there's a layer of aluminum, a layer of copper, another layer of aluminum, and then another layer of stainless steel on the inside. And this sandwiching of the different materials gives these pots an amazing, uh, amazing properties of both they heat up quickly, they heat up evenly. That's probably the most important part. The sandwiching of the aluminum and the copper between the stainless steel. Stainless steel means that they work on an induction cooktop or a gas cooktop or an electric cooktop, any cooktop. But the sandwiching of those other materials means that they have extremely even heat and great um, heat characteristics and that they heat up quickly and they hold heat a little bit longer. They don't cool down quickly. Fantastic pots. Um, if you can find a used set of these, that would be great. And if you're looking for stainless steel pots, I would suggest a set that does sandwich um, aluminum and copper between the stainless steel uh, just for all of those properties that I mentioned. Now, um, I do use this a lot. I use this a lot. These are cast iron. I have a lot of bare cast iron, and you'll see that I use those a lot as well. I love bare cast iron, but I am somewhat agnostic when it comes to the pots that I use, or the pots and pans that I use, because not every property of every pot and pan is important for every dish. Cast iron's great for throwing in the oven. Cast iron, bare or enameled, um, has some properties that I absolutely can't stand. The main one is that they take a long time to heat up. And in some operations, that, that time to heat up is too long, and also that they retain heat too long, sometimes you want a pan that loses heat quickly, especially if you're doing a stir fry. So you want something that's thin and probably high carbon steel. Heats up fast, loses heat fast. That's great for stir fries and some other operations. Um, they also don't heat evenly. Uh, just the property of the material that it's made from, you'll get hot spots. And so that heating process in order to even out the heat becomes incredibly important. So I use a wide range of pots and pans. I'm not tied to one, one material or one style or size. I use what's appropriate and I am very fortunate that I'm able to have most of what I need here in the kitchen. Here's a question I get over and over and over again. Why is there blue tape on your stand mixer? So, I've been doing this a long time. I've worked in advertising for years, and one of the things that you do in advertising is you Greek out brands or logos from other brands that the brand you're advertising for doesn't want to see. And so when I started this channel in 2007, I was filming a lot of stuff for other people that they would put on their YouTube channel or their website. Nobody wanted to see the KitchenAid brand name. And so I would put tape over the brand name to hide 
the KitchenAid logo. Not fooling anyone because obviously everyone looks at this and knows that it's KitchenAid already and it also says KitchenAid here on the bowl. But the brands didn't want to see it so I put the tape on. And then I wound up just leaving the tape on all the time uh, because I didn't want to get into a position where we were partway through a shoot day and then think, oh no, I forgot to put the tape back on. So I just leave it on. I don't do that work anymore. Um, but I've just never bothered to take the blue tape off. I don't know why it's on there. It's part of this machine. But if you look at some of the other KitchenAids in the, in the kitchen, um, I haven't taped over them because they arrived after I was doing this work. Or um, they were just versions of KitchenAids that I never used uh, in the shooting for other brands. And yes, over here, this is a lot of stuff that I have for Cocktails After Dark. You can see stuff that I'm working on. And all of these cupboards are filled with alcohol and bitters. And up here, we've got all kinds of glasses and mixers and shakers. Um, it takes a lot of stuff to produce this, this show. Um, and I've been working at it for a long time, so it didn't just go out and buy everything. I've just bought stuff as I go along. I mean, I've had this channel, like I said, since 2007, and I've had to buy a lot of stuff in order to do work for other clients. Now, on the channel itself, I don't take or do any sponsorships or sponsored content anymore. Um, I find it very disruptive to stop in the middle of a video and talk to you about something that's unrelated to cooking, like multivitamins or you know VPNs or some video game or shave cream. I just can't do it, it's not me. I'm not faulting anyone else who does that on their channel. That's their business model, they're comfortable doing it. I just can't do it. So this channel relies completely on the pre-roll ads that YouTube puts up. Um, that is the only source of income that helps me pay or offset the cost for what's going on here. Now, question I get all the time is what happened to the dry agers? The dry agers used to be here. Um, they were on loan for a year. I only had them for a year. So we played around with them. At the end of the year, I sent them back. Um, I was done with them. They offered to let me keep them, but it's just Julie and I. And as an experiment, it worked great. But for as an ongoing um, concern, Julie and I just weren't going to use it. Um, I got to tell you, it was expensive to fill those things with meat. It was expensive uh, to experiment with them, and we just couldn't eat it fast enough. So the dry agers are gone. They have gone back to the company. We only had them for a year. All of the content that used the dry agers on the channel, that is finite. You can watch those, but there will be no more. And it's not something that I will probably ever revisit in the future. But having said that, I'm sure that'll come back and bite me later. Now, I'm not going to address cookbooks today. Um, you can see some cookbooks here in front of me on a shelf at the front of the counter. Those are sort of the middle of the road recent cookbooks. They're not very valuable. The more valuable collection is kept inside. I will at some point do a, a, a video about that cookbook collection. Um, in the grander scheme of things, um, my collection is fairly small. I have been, uh, over the years, very careful to collect between certain years and cookbooks that have a certain theme. The collection has grown over the last few years because the generosity of our viewers who send us cookbooks. So I have been expanding what I've, what I've been collecting, but I still only collect really pre-World War II cookbooks uh, and earlier, mostly community or church-based cookbooks are the ones that I really want to collect because those tell me a lot more about um, what people were cooking or what people aspired to cook. I do have a fairly large collection of corporate cookbooks, um, cookbooks that were meant to sell people a product by showing them what they could cook with it. So at some point I will do a cookbook video all on its own, but it may be a year or two from now before I actually get down to figuring out what I want to expand on and tell you about. But I enjoy the questions. So if there are any questions that you want answered in a future video, please leave them down below. I'd love to hear them. And the last question I want to get to is, yes, I am alone in the studio. I am always alone in the studio. I cook alone in the studio. I set up the camera. I set up the sound. I set up the lighting. I step behind here. I do some stuff. 
I go back over, I move the camera, I do some stuff. I go back over, I move the camera, and I do some stuff. And then when Julie comes home from work, because she has a day job, she gets home from work 5, 5.30 at night. She comes out and we do a tasting. So really, Julie does show up at the end of the day, doesn't know what I'm cooking all day, tastes something, doesn't know what she's going to taste until it's in front of her. I am alone here in the studio all day. With you, of course. So, um, I hope this has answered some of the, uh, the most burning questions that people ask me all the time. Again, leave some more questions in the comments. Um, we really appreciate you watching these videos. This channel would be nothing without our viewers. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon. Now I walk over here and I turn off the camera.